Ciao a tutti, dopo avervi raccontato come va lo SRAM Eagle Access è il momento di eh, entrare un po' più nel dettaglio insieme a Chris Hilton, il ragazzo di SRAM che si occupa dello sviluppo delle trasmissioni. So Chris, how long have you been testing and thinking about this new product? Uh, ciao, grazie. First of all, thanks for, <laughs> thanks for coming and uh, seeing us out here in the desert. Uh, <laughs> thanks to you. <laughs> uh, well, we built the first prototypes of this uh, several years ago, about five years ago. In fact, the first prototypes bef were built before we even launched Eagle to the market. Wow. So the, the first prototypes were actually built on our 11-speed drivetrain at the time. I know you have been testing this product with, uh, with Nino in the uh, uh, World Cup yeah. since the last year. Um, which is the, the most difficult part to be developed? Uh, well, they're actually both difficult, but in different ways. Uh, the derailleur is difficult because it's a, it's a very complex, uh, functional, moving part. Uh, there's a lot of new parts added to the derailleur that we didn't have in the past. Gearboxes and motors and batteries and things like this. So it's a very complicated technical challenge for the derailleur. Uh, the shifter is a different type of challenge. It's, it's, it's relatively simple. There's not really moving parts, only switches and transmitters and a small power source. But the ergonomics and the shape and the packaging of it are very important. So they're two both equally difficult but very different challenges. And that's what kind of was interesting about it. Wow, wow, I can imagine, I can imagine. So basically, the shifter is completely new because the ergonomic is different yes. compared to the mechanical, I would say. Yes. And, but thanks to the app, you can also adjust the way the shifter reacts to, your, to, your, to the push of the button, yes. basically. With the app, you can change the direction of the shifter, meaning you can completely reverse it. Uh, you can change the number of shifts that occur when you hold the button down. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of different things you can do with it uh, to customize the shifter to feel however you want it to feel. Uh, the reason that it's different than a mechanical shifter is that a mechanical shifter, um, you have to actually perform an, uh, um, a mechanical operation. You have to pull and release cable. Yeah, yeah. And your hand is the motor that makes yeah. the derailleur move. Yes, yes. Well, we've replaced the motor in your hand with a motor in the derailleur. And the derailleur now does all the work. So this shifter only has to send a signal to the derailleur to do the work, which means we could completely free up the ergonomics uh, to not have to have a big mechanical advantage and move a long distance or require a lot of force to move. So if when you ride the system, you find that it, it, it's quite easy to push the button and actuate, somewhat like using um, a car that has windows where you push a button for them to go down versus cranking a handle. Uh, and it really does make a big difference, especially as you out here in the desert where it's hot and the climbing is very technical and difficult. It actually allows you to shift in places that with a mechanical system, you might have avoided the shift because you're worried about not quite getting it right. Yeah. So yeah. it really yeah. does help make the shifting easier for people to do. Even professional users like Nino and the Scott SRAM team benefit, you know, they're professional bike riders. They know how to shift, but they benefit from the ease of use as well, as do normal riders like ourselves. Wow, interesting, really interesting. You mentioned a Nino, but I know that the SRAM Eagle Access has been tested also in, uh, in Enduro, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had Mitch Ropolato racing it at Enduro World Series events this year. Um, but we've also used Jerome Clements this year, who yeah. was semi-retired, but still raced a heck of a lot. Um, who's been a long-time development friend of ours since before early, X, early XX1 days. Uh, great guy to work with. He's also been kind of very quietly racing it at different events. In fact, if you look at a few events, he's kind of standing in front of the derailleur on his bike <laughs> check. So uh, he's been a great guy to work with as well and, and obviously a really good rider. Plus, we have a pool of about 80 test riders. Uh, some are SRAM employees, some are just hardcore bike riders that we've used to test this for the last several years to make sure that it's really, really ready for off-road use. Okay, okay. I know that a lot of people now are wondering what's going on, what's happened, what would happen in case of impact? Yeah. How the rear derailleur reacts to an impact? Can you show yeah. us? Yeah, obviously on a mountain bike, there's different challenges than on a road bike. Uh, on a road bike, maybe it gets a little bit of sweat on it or some dust or something, but in off-road conditions, uh, things can be rugged and unpredictable. Bikes even fall over or run into each other. Um, impacts are something that happens and you have to assume they will and plan around that. In the case of the mountain bike rear derailleur, um, we have a gearbox and a clutch and a motor all built into the rear derailleur to help it function. The clutch, as you normally know it, is used for chain retention. So the clutch yeah. down here, we still use that clutch for chain retention. 
We now have a secondary clutch that's attached to the gearbox. And what that does is in the event of a collision, the clutch is set to a force to where the gearbox becomes isolated from the rest of the derailleur. So when you run into a rock or you hit some object, the derailleur will actually break away from the gearbox yeah, yeah. and it will not damage any of the parts inside the derailleur. What it does then is when you make a shift, the shift information is stored in the rear derailleur. The rear derailleur remembers where you wanted it to be, and so the clutch disengages, but then the derailleur automatically shifts back to its present location. So essentially, you don't have to do anything. Yeah. If you hit a rock and disengage the clutch, after a second, the derailleur comes back to its location and you just keep pedaling. There's no buttons to push or, or anything to move. It's all, it's all done automatically. Um, and that's something that works both not just inboard, but also outboard. If you yeah, were to get yeah, a stick yeah. jammed in the derailleur, yeah, the yeah. clutch disengage uh, either direction. So it's a great safety feature to keep the derailleur operating, but it's also something that um, helps protect derailleurs in the event of an inevitable collision. Wow, interesting. Um, the battery, how long the battery lasts? So what we find is on the mountain bike rear derailleur, uh, same battery we use on our road drive trains today, um, the battery will last, uh, I'd say a minimum of 25 hours of riding time on okay. the rear derailleur, okay. uh, about 40 hours on the seat post. Yeah. The reason they're different, even though it's the same battery, so you can swap them anytime you want. Uh, the battery consumption is mostly driven by energy requirements. So the derailleur has to work significantly harder to shift the gears back and forth than the seat post has to work to open and close a valve. Yeah. So that's yeah. why you get less ride time. That being said, um, I'd say the vast majority of people will see in excess of 25 hours, which is really a good amount of time. I mean, 25 hours is a really big week. Yeah, if you can yeah. ride that much, you need to get a job or something. But um, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> uh, but I think that it's not important that you have a very, very long battery lifespan because then you start to forget to charge it. 25 hours is nice because then it's like, okay, every, every, every Friday you charge your battery before your big weekend of riding. And so it, just like your phone. You know, if it lasted for six days, inevitably on the sixth day, you would be like, oh, I forgot. Um, so I think it's, it's okay that we don't have, we wanted to prioritize performance over battery life. Yeah. Um, because yeah. charging it's not difficult. You can take it off the bike, plug it into your computer, charge it up. It takes an hour and a half or, or less to charge, to full charge. Um, there's also on the app, you can see battery life of all the devices. But on the device itself, you can actually see the battery life through an LED. So green means the charge is good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, red means charge is getting lower, but you still have plenty of time. Blinking red means um, you got you, you've got, well, it actually means that you should consider charging the battery soon. Okay. Uh, I've ridden as, you know, almost 10 hours on a blinking red battery, like three rides. Not a good idea, but I carried a spare battery. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, it's another thing too that's nice is you get this little 25 gram battery, you just stick one in your pack or even in your pocket or tape it to your frame and, and you've always got one that you could use for either of the devices. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, talking about weight, can you, can you tell me how much which is the difference between the Eagle XX1 Eagle Access yeah. and their XX Eagle XS1 Eagle, the so, mechanical? Yeah, so um, the derailleur does add a little bit of weight because there's more complexity. There's now a battery attached to it. Um, but in general, uh, our XX1 Access group is lighter than our first generation XX1 Eagle mechanical group was. Wow. Uh, the dub crank and some other things have come along to now bring the weight of the mechanical group down too. Um, but today, if you compare current XX1 mechanical uh, to XX1 access, uh, I'll just say they're about the same, although this system is about 10 to 15 grams lighter, if you include everything. And that's cable and housing and battery and everything required to make the system work. Yeah, thank you. So it's thank a little lighter, but more or less the bit. same. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Chris, who would you recommend this group set? Who is intended for? Um, I think, you know, it's there's certainly an opportunity for everybody to enjoy riding it. That being said, I don't see this group set as a replacement for the product we make today. Um, our XX1, X01, GX, and NX Eagle drivetrains are really, really good drivetrains. And this, I think, is just an addition to the Eagle family. It's not meant to replace what we have today, even though it's called XX1 and X01. It doesn't mean our mechanical systems go away. In fact, we will continue to make developments and improvements and advancements on all of our mechanical systems. This is just a choice for people that, I think, um, people that are really um, aware of 
good functioning drivetrains, uh, and some people are and, and some people aren't. Some people don't really care too much about drivetrains. Some people don't care about suspension or geometry. Everyone has kind of individual or particular tastes. Yeah, yeah. Um, if somebody is really, uh, doesn't mean they have to be a performance rider, but appreciates a, a really well shifting uh, drivetrain, this is, this is for them. It's also nice because you no longer have the maintenance of the mechanical cable oh, and yeah. housing, yeah. which especially on today's modern bikes where they go all through the well, frame, yeah. it, it can be, can be challenging. It, um, yeah. um, and as they get dusty and dirty or wet, you have to take care of them because this, this, the quality of the shifting starts to get worse. With this system, it doesn't matter what the conditions are. The quality of the shifting stays the same. You know, you should always lube your chain and keep it clean. Uh, but that being said, you don't see cable and housing service, so I think it's, it's great for traveling. It's really easy to remove these components, put oh, them yeah, someplace yeah. safe in your bag. Um, so, I, you know, I don't think it's necessarily for racers. It's not necessarily for amateur riders, but it's for people that appreciate really good drivetrain performance. Uh, Chris, uh, last but not the least, RockShox, the, yes. new, the new reverb has been updated with the, the access. So this is very an interesting improvement. Uh, I've just tested it yesterday with a small loop here. Yeah. And it's really, it looks very, very interesting. Um, how long have you been testing and developing this product? This one's been um, in development a little bit less than our drivetrain. So it's about two and a half or three years that this has been in development. Um, it uses um, similar internals to what we have on the Reverb today, although they've been updated and improved. Um, but it uses a, as you know, an, a, an electronic wireless controller and a motor and a gearbox inside the seat post head to actuate it. This one's interesting because the response time from the controller to the seat post is practi practically instant. Yeah, uh, so yeah. one thing you might have noticed is yes, that there's absolutely yes. no delay. Really? So the signal speed with the rear derailleur shifter and the reverb shifter, they're very, very, very fast. And it takes people some time to get used to that. What you find is that you can, once you get used to it, you can micro adjust the post very, very quickly and very easily because you no longer have this big hydraulic force and movement required to get to the open valve position. So it's really easy to just up and down it as you ride, especially technical trails like they have here in Tucson. Absolutely, absolutely. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Chris. Yeah, grazie. For thanks for having me. Yeah. <laughs> Ragazzi, io vi invito a leggere l'articolo che vi spiegherà tutti i dettagli su quello che sono pesi e prezzi del, di questi componenti di cui abbiamo parlato, sull'articolo che trovate linkato qui eh, in alto a destra. Eh, ciò detto, vi saluto da Tucson e vi invito a iscrivervi al nostro canale YouTube, per cui ci vediamo alla prossima. Thanks Chris! Grazie, ciao! Ciao! <ride>